Hello, uh, everybody. Welcome to our weekly Thursday general meeting for Southern Oregon Family Farms, which is a OLCC sun grown owner operator producer cooperative. Our main goal is to help the farmer members own the dispensary channels and cooperate to create more efficient um, business plans to compete against corporate cannabis model. Southern Oregon Family Farm started about eight months ago um, with a couple members needing to fix the short-term cash flow issue um, because a lot of wholesalers were not serving the farmers as traditionally speaking. So we cooperated together to share menus and distribution channels so that we could own that relationship as a group because taking on that cost individually is less efficient and effective. The cooperative has changed throughout the last couple months as uh, the needs of the cooperative have changed. We've taken on new members and we've taken on new goals and initiatives, looking at a wider approach to the position of us farms in the Oregon market and also as this market expands across the United States. Recently, we have gotten uh, some documentation from Greenlight Law that really helped to lay out the groundwork for creating cooperatives, which after reading that, all of our members kind of took a step back and realized that we need to reapproach our foundation. So our current initiative is to start from the beginning again, even though we've made some proper steps in creating the cooperative and the board of directors and code of ethics and uh, criteria for membership, we wanna make sure it's done correctly and proficiently. So here we are back at the beginning stages, looking at all the different um, tools that we can utilize to increase the professionalism of our group and broadcasting our message to both the, the consumers and also peers within the industry. And also looking to refine our approach to establishing a dispensary direct distribution model where we all cooperate to help each other succeed against the corporate cannabis model. Um, now we'll do a short introduction into our farm members. We'll keep it to about 30 seconds each. And then we'll also open up the floor to prospective members, a short introduction from them. And then thirdly, we'll open up the floor to a little bit longer introduction from our professional service providers. That would include uh, partnerships such as wholesalers, processors, and or professional services um, such as Greenlight Law that's on the call here today. So how about we start first with uh, Justin, Board of Directors and founder um, of Calix. Board, tre board Treasurer. Board Treasurer, great. Yep, yep. Um, I am uh, CEO of Calix CPAs. I've been doing tax, uh, business advisory and tax accounting for the industry. Um, I've been self-employed since 2006, but I've been niching in the cannabis industry since 2014-15 um, as uh, recreational uh, marijuana started to become legal or uh, people were gearing up for rec here. Um, now about 80, we have about 200 clients that are in the cannabis industry one way or another, mostly licensed, mostly growers, mostly just and dispensaries, um, and uh, that that is, that's about eighty percent of our portfolio. So we, it's not all we do, but it's mostly what we do. And um, and I'm just really happy to be here and seeing all of your beautiful faces this morning. Thank you, Justin. I wanted to call upon Christine Miller, the cooperative's president, and have her introduce her farm. Hi, I'm Christine Miller. I am the owner and grower of Southern Oregon Moonshine. I'm a second generation cannabis farmer here in Southern Oregon. And um, we are full season, full sun, um, sustainable cannabis producers um, who strongly believe in plant medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I wanted to open up the floor to Devin Parker, uh, the brother farm of Southern Oregon Moonshine, Circle D. Hi, my name is Devin Parker. I'm owner, operator, grower of Circle D Farms. Pretty much the same thing as Christine. Both our farms are on the same property out in the Illinois Valley. Uh, here to just co-op together, shore up prices, and uh, hopefully the sun-grown craft cannabis will succeed. 
Great. Um, Scott, why don't you introduce yourself and BZS Resources? Hey, guys, Scott here, BZS Resources, uh, Mouth of the Applegate, Confluence of the Applegate and Rogue River, um, located across from Aaron. Um, yeah, outdoor tier two grower, uh, trying to make it in this tight world these days. Great. Thank you, Scott. Let's hear from Green Bandit. Hi, I'm Sarah, uh, co-owner of Green Bandit. My husband, Brian, is the grower and out in the field right now. And we are one tier two, uh, full, full term sun grown. We practice regenerative farming and, uh, you know, growing in the native soil and all of that good biodynamic regenerative stuff. Um, environmental uh, stewardship is a core value of ours. So not only the regenerative farming, but all of our packaging to consumers is also uh, biodegradable compostable materials. And um, yeah, uh, we, <laughs> huh. we won a few awards at the Leaf Bowl this year. <laughs> Aaron's always good at reminding me to, to share that part. <laughs> um, yeah, two first place awards and one runner up. And um, we are also getting uh, featured as strain of the month in Oregon Leaf in next month's harvest this year. So yeah, fun stuff. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Patrick, a rogue ganja and massive seeds. Can we hear from you, please? Hey there, guys. My name is Patrick Butch. I am co-owner with my brother, Peter, at Roganja and Massive Seeds. We do outdoor, full-term, grown by seed out here in Eagle Point, Oregon, um, tier two. Just enjoy the medicine of the plant, growing the plant, beautiful. Um, grown by seed, we experience so many different phenotypes and different smells that we work with throughout the years and keep going. Um, pleasure to be in this group and can't wait moving forward. Thank you so much, Patrick. Can we hear from Rhea Miller of Millerville Farms? Good morning, everybody. My name is Rhea Miller and my husband, Matt, and I own and operate Millerville Farms. We are in Tequilma, Oregon, out of Cave Junction. And uh, we are full sun and uh, light depth grown cannabis, um, focusing in some pr proprietary genetics, including Matt's original Jaeger. And we're happy to be here. Thank you so much, Rhea. Um, I think I'm the last person of existing members to introduce myself. My name's Aaron. I'm at the confluence of the Applegate and Rogue right next to BZS Resources with Scott. Um, we have two tier twos. We plant in native soil. I really and passionate, passionate about regenerative can, cannabis and organic farming, although it's been difficult to fully implement at scale over the years, especially with the, the cost and the markets um, fluctuating so much. I've resorted to using some salts, which has really helped to pick up my THC numbers, but my intention is really to focus on organic cannabis and being a part of the group and brainstorming and production methods to uh, up my game is really an exciting aspect to be a part of this group. So thank you so much for letting uh, the farm members introduce themselves. I wanted to open up the floor to prospective members, first being Tyler of Coomba Hills. You're on mute, Ty Tyler. Whoops. Uh, Tyler with Coomba Hills. Uh, we are located outside of Rogue River uh, in Weimar. We are a tier two sun-grown light depth farm. Uh, we also are organic with a little bit of hybrid salt um, to boost our numbers, very similar to Aaron. I'm hoping that this year we can lock in a scalable tea regimen that is cost-effective at the current numbers. And yeah. That's pretty much it. You also have a great cloning operation. Don't forget. Oh, yeah. about that. We, do a, we do a large clone op as well, about 50,000 clones a year. Heck yeah. All right. Well, let's hear from Noah Benson Arbor. Yeah. Hi, uh, Noah Benson Arbor. I guess I'm an owner operator. Uh, I don't do as much farming. You know, I started the company um, 
been growing since 2005, uh, but now these days uh, focus on sales and networking and, um, you know, growing the brand, new product development. Uh, we have uh, four tier twos in the Applegate Valley, uh, two on top of Wood Rat Mountain, and then two uh, right outside of Roosh uh, on the Applegate River. Um, we're fully organic. It's, it's actually interesting. Um, now I've heard two of you say that you moved to salts to get higher THC numbers. Um, and that's, I've, I've never heard that before. So um, down the line, I'd, I'd be open to talking about what we do from a nutrient perspective, um, because we uh, produce really great numbers when we want to. Um, and we've never seen uh, a need to push salts. And if you guys don't want to, um, I'd love to help out. We grow in an all native soil. Uh, we, I guess I could say I'm a breeder. I think of myself more as just like, a, you know, I, I select males without too much besides terpene profile, uh, maybe a little structure. And then we pollinate our best selections from seeds from other breeders. Kind of hard to take credit for that because, you know, you're standing on the shoulders of everybody who bred those plants before you. Um, but that's our current direction is uh, a large amount of proprietary genetics. Um, that we could bring to market. Awesome, Noah. Thank you so much. Um, hey, Noah, what's your last name real quick? Uh, Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E. -E. Thank you. All right, so now we're on to prof professional service as an ancillary supportive partnerships. Um, I haven't met Addie yet, but I'm interested to hear from her and hear your introduction. Sure. My name is Dr. Adie Ray. Um, I'm probably the, the most, I'm a neuroscientist, but the most relevant to this discussion is one of the executive um, committee members of the Cultivation Classic. Um, so we've definitely had at least some of your flowers in the cup in uh, years past. I was invited here by Justin and Andrew. I'm incredibly passionate about all of the hard work that you all do, and I'm very interested to see simply how I can support you from um, a scientific rigor kind of standpoint, being able to standardize the quality of your products and transmit the value of that quality to the rest of the market. Wow, short and sweet and very concise. That's awesome. And how do you spell How do you say, pronounce your name again? It's 80. 80. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much, 80. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Um, why don't we pass the floor to Jeremy Hunsaker? Good morning. Thank you all for letting me join again. Um, so I now run a distribution company for Agricola Collective. Um, in the past, I worked for Winberry Farms, which got acquired by Dime. We had a great run there with distribution and building our partnerships. That got acquired by Halo. That turned out horrible. I'm sure everybody has heard or has their own opinions of Halo. I'm excited to not be with them anymore. However, um, I've learned a lot by being with them. I've got a lot of great relationships. I know who does well in the industry and who does not do so well in the industry to align the right partners going forward. Um, that being said, with that relationship that I had with Halo, it allowed me to get out and meet Aaron, Christine, Devin, many of you guys that are on this call we've worked with in the past. Um, I am switching gears from being with the big corporate conglomerate, the publicly traded people that were making money off of investors and taking advantage of farmers, to where now. I'm working for an independently held farmer and he also owns a dispensary. So he knows full circle on how the whole thing works, which I'm excited about his understanding of how tough it is to be a farmer and to get yourself to the dispensaries. So we had distributed for him in the past. Once he realized I was no longer with them, he said, hey, can you come and set the same thing up for me? Help his distribution costs and also help other farmers get their stuff distributed across the state. So took on that role a little bit hesitantly. <laughs> um, and then in the process, I've decided to go after Halo. 
Now, that being said, I'm working on a lawsuit against Halo right now for all the small farms that they've taken advantage of, they owe money to. So if you're one of those, please reach out to me. Let me know how much they owe you. One of the owners of this distribution company is an attorney, which is very helpful. So I'm working on getting a cease and desist order for Halo right now because I believe they're selling stolen product. They got material from many different farms. They blasted the material. They did not pay for it. Now they're selling those products into the dispensaries that they made out of that oil. So I'm working on shutting them down and also in the process, building and helping the small farms get their products all across the state. That being said, I am currently vetting new partners as far as farms um, on who we're gonna distribute for. I've been working with Christine and Devin and Aaron for a while, and I'm excited about those relationships and hoping to find some more like that. I work very closely with the sales team that is out meeting with these dispensaries. So I have feedback, current active feedback from dispensaries, what they're saying about the flower and about the market that I would love to share with my partner farms on a regular basis. So we have our thumb on the pulse of what's going on out there. Thank, Thank you, you again for having me. Yeah. And I have a couple of questions for you and keep, have, lead you have the floor a little bit longer. It's about this uh, distribution venture you're under um, working with. Um, so when vetting new partnerships, um, you know, Christine and Devin have a high grade product, very professional presentation. And those are the type of, of farms that makes your job a lot more easy or at least um, fluid to be able to represent and flows well with the menu. Uh, my, myself, I'm one of those people that tries my best, but sometimes trying your best isn't good enough. And so I, I'm one of those people that, you know, wants to be better, but when approaching new farm partnerships, could you talk a little bit about the, the intention of taking on farms that have a quality product, professional representation, standardization, um, and, you know, that whole topic? Sure. Uh, one of the big things for me is, like you said, professionalism. Um, we've worked with a lot of farms. I, I started this thing out not knowing what I was doing. I feel like I know a little bit more now, but it's still a lot to learn. Um, the fact that if you grow a great product, that's, that's one thing. That's first and foremost. But you also have to be able to do a great job with your metric, your manifest, professionalism, have stuff ready on time, be able to do what you say you're going to do. I mean, it's, it seems pretty basic, but um, also with Christine and Devin, we've learned along the way and we've worked together and that's who I really want. I want somebody that I can work together with as we learn what's going on. And I bring this feedback from the sales team to the farm and say, Hey, these dispensers are saying they would like to see it like this, you know, and, trying to be creative and work together, um, having a brand rep. So I, I want farms that are truly going to partner and take some initiative on this. I understand the farm doesn't have time to deliver two pounds of flour to Astoria. I will do that. I will collect the money. I'll bring the money back. That's, that's a challenge when you're trying to harvest and do everything else. It's not realistic. However, if I can have somebody from the farm that's an active brand rep that my salespeople can reach out to with any questions and also help educate my sales team on how to represent that product is very important. Um, so the fact that all the bags are tagged correctly, they have all the information on them that the dispensaries are um, happy to see, they'll take it. Right, but there's a lot of other things that most people think price and percentage when you're looking at a dispensary. Price is always important, but it's not the most important. If you can take your packages there and they don't have any issues with the manifest, they don't have anything that's given them a possible, um, possible ding on their metric. Sorry, I lost the word right there for a second, but um, we have we have some of those where they'll get flagged for a possible violation that can't work 
when, when I go out there and sell a pound of flour to a dispensary and they get red flag for a uh, possible violation, they don't want to buy from that farm again. It's very important. And that's more important than the $50 per pound difference they paid to somebody else. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into this, getting that stuff and building those relationships with the dispensaries and getting consistent ordering um, that I feel myself and our team does a great job with vetting that before we get it to the dispensaries. So that's when I say I'm, I'm vetting farms. I, I'm not just taking on anybody that's going to give me their wheat. I, I did that at first and that was a bad, a bad idea. So I'm going through and learning how you do things. And most importantly, I want to learn how we can work together, what I can do to help the farm. How can I help the farm without costing them too much money, make it realistic. I know everything's tight right now, but I also know everything's going to continue to go up with the foreseeable future. And then we're going to be in a great place, but we've got to get it out to market in order to do that. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, would you be able to touch a little bit on your intention in separating yourself from other wholesalers in working with Southern Oregon family farms and sharing, you know, where these product is going and providing the opportunity for vendor days and essentially looking at how, how our, a partnership would work together. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, in the past, we were always concerned. Everybody is worried about themselves. I'm worried that if I go land an account and I share that information with the farm then the dispensary calls the farm, tries to cut the middleman out, right? That's always been a concern with distribution because you don't want to go do all the legwork, have your salespeople go land these accounts, build this deal, and then, oh, I can save 20%. I can save some money if I just go direct to the farm and then they, they kick out the middleman. Well, if I have the right partners, that's not a concern. I want to share everything with you as far as where that product is so you can help blast them on Instagram, share that knowledge, get the sell through of that product. Um, and I believe if I have the right partners, they're not going to be doing that. They, Christine, for example, she doesn't want to go up, drive all over the state to distribute their product. She just wants somebody she can count on that can do that. And I hope, I hope that's okay that I speak for you on that, Christine. Um, but that's, hoping you would. <laughs> what's that? I was hoping you would. I think that it's, I'm glad we're touching base on this because that's one of the most important things for me is not who delivers my product, but how it's represented and being able to like give support for follow through with like, if they have a string question or a cultivation question or anything, I can answer that. And me selling myself and my cultivation practices is going to go directly through like educating bud tenders and educating consumers. And we already know we can't distribute for anywhere near 20% ourselves and not effectively or efficiently. So we need partners with people who are going to be mutually beneficial. Like if I promote myself, well, you're going to make more sales and I'm going to make more sales. And it's just like going to turn into like this beautiful machine. So, yeah. Awesome. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that because the fee that we charge, we're, we're not getting rich on distribution. We're helping offset our own distribution. And hopefully at some day when the prices get back up where they're supposed to be, we will be able to be profitable at 20, 25% distribution fee. And by doing things the right way, we'll have a full team. And when, even with the salespeople I've worked with in the past, they go to work for a farm or a manufacturer. There's not enough business there to keep a sales team happy. You, you run out of product and then they, they're limited on how much money they can make. My salespeople have no cap. If we're selling for a dozen farms and our own farms, they, there's plenty of product. They're not going to run out of product. I am uh, careful on what I put as far as finished goods. We have live rosin. We've got pre-rolls, infused pre-rolls. I try not to cloud that too much so we can really focus and not do a good enough job for each one. Same thing with farms. I don't want to have too many farms to where I'm not making anybody happy. You know, and that's why I'm not just taking on everybody. If I only sell five pounds for each farm, no one's going to be that happy with me. I want to be able to know and understand the farms we're representing and have those relationships with the farmers that we can call and rely on when, when we need their assistance. Uh, and we, we've got some fun promotional stuff that we will do with 
with owners of the, of the manufacturing and the farmers where we get to do a vendor day and and bring people together. I I really think everybody's worried that somebody's taking advantage of them. The dispensaries, I hear for so many farmers, the dispensaries are just ripping everybody off. But my owner owning a dispensary, he's given me the insight on dispensaries and they're not all doing so great either. You know, so getting the dispensary owners and the farmers together in our events to help kind of figure out what what needs to happen. Because if we know what needs to happen on it going out the door, we can set up from that at the farm level going to the door. So these are the things I'm working on, trying to create a good partnership all the way across and be in that bridge to communicate the two together. Um, I want a quick uh, question and then Noah will be up. And then uh, if we could, we will move on to green light. Um, so my question was uh, Southern Oregon Family Farms originally, and still it's in, the, in our uh, ambitions to own our own wholesale and be involved in distribution. Um, one of the main holdups to that is the costs and the professional ex expertise required to run a wholesale. Um, would you maybe be able to take Noah's question, but um, maybe after or during the question, we might be able to touch on some of the ins and outs and the logistics and like the overhead and like, you know, have the idea of a farmer becoming a wholesaler and trying to negotiate what that business model looks like. Yep. So if we could, let's touch on uh, Noah and hear what his question is. Uh, I was just curious uh, uh, how many farms you plan on representing? Because um, it, it seems to me that, man, you get over five, six outdoor farms, even even five, uh, and you'd be, uh, it'd be hard to be selling everyone's products to your existing network. Yeah, that's a great question. And I plan on having a dozen and then letting it grow. Um, and when I say that, one of the big things that I want to boast about on my menu is having the variety, right? Anytime you go into a dispensary, they're going to need something. As a farm, they may not need what you have, but as a distribution, when I have over a hundred different strains, I've got indoor, outdoor, the, the, the different qualities of sun grown, um, if you will. And so many different strains we should be able to plug something in in each dispensary that we stop at and with building these relationships to get the consistent ordering as we get it consistent enough to where we're doing a good enough job for each farm then we can add more farms i plan on getting my sales team that's seven right now up to 21 so once we got enough traction we'll we will let it grow organically um that being said, we had a sales team up to 21 in the past with Halo, three different sales teams, and we were doing $4 million a month. So it, the, the opportunity is out there for sure to, to grow this to multiple farms and, and that. But right now, we've got to do a good job for the ones we are representing. Um, hey, thank you, Jeremy. Hey, I'm just for the purpose of this uh, video recording so that I can, I, what I try to do is keep it down to an hour. Aaron, would it be okay if we shelved um, the additional question for Jeremy? Sure. Allow everybody else who are guests uh, to kind of have some time to speak and yeah. then come back to additional questions kind of after the hour. Sounds good. Let's hear okay. from Greenlight Law, Perry and Andrew. Great. Uh, thanks. My name is Andrew DeWeese. I'm a partner here at Greenlight Law Group. Um, I mostly handle litigation and uh, regulatory matters. So our, I, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that our firm has been involved with probably a substantial plurality of all of the OLCC violation uh, cases involving, or at least serious ones, um, involving uh, marijuana. We have a, a very um, robust practice in that area. I also do litigation. Um, my partner, Perry, um, I'll let him introduce uh, himself, but he, he, he's the one with the more in-depth knowledge of co-ops. He's a 
um, a, a corporate and transactions uh, attorney who's based out of our Seattle office, but uh, licensed in Oregon and New York. Um, you know, I, I've um, been in this space for, you know, since about 2014, and I've seen what's happened in the industry. My perspective, I guess, is probably a little bit colored by the fact that um, I'm generally uh, the guy who gets called when shit's hitting the fan. So I've seen a lot of the industry at its worst and a lot of the worst problems. Um, so for the past few years, um, uh, or, or more recently, I've been advocating that people form co-ops um, uh, simply to you know, protect themselves from the big money interests um, in, in, in the state. And, and so you can share costs and coordinate to survive. Um, so when I, when I started looking into it, uh, my associate Brett and I decided to um, write a paper about it. And one of the reasons we did that is that we realized that um, agricultural production uh, co-ops have, uh, uh, you know, abilities under uh, federal antitrust law that no other businesses have. So, you know, uh, uh, things like uh, th things that in, in other businesses would be totally illegal and um, would result in pr uh, uh, potential criminal penalties or um, civil damages uh, are legal in the context of agricultural uh, 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 production collectives. So um, it, it can be uh, coordinating together in the right way can give you um, an incredible competitive advantage as we've seen with, um, you know, larger uh, agricultural collectives like, um, you know, Ocean Spray, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Organic Valley, different, uh, you know, wi widely known names that are uh, doing quite well in, in this model. So, um, you know, when, when Aaron contacted us about, um, about you guys, we were very excited to, to help and, and be involved in in any way that's useful for you guys. Um, I'll turn it over to Perry to talk about his experience in, in co-ops and, and- Hi, thanks, Andrew. I'm Perry Salzauer. I'm one of Andrew's partners at Greenlight Law Group. Um, I head the corporate transaction securities team and I have this new desk that just keeps moving up and down on its own. Sorry about that, hold on. Um, <laughs> Where the controls are, they don't work for me. Um, I was a marijuana grower. I've, I've grown marijuana. I did. I don't anymore. I did for some 20 years, um, mostly indoors, um, medical before that, medical. A couple couple summers outdoors on the peninsula in Washington, um, where we also have mold problems. Um, we were talking about that earlier. Um, so I, I, I'd like to say that I have somewhat of an insight into what the grower's lifestyle is like, in addition to what I understand about marijuana law and corporate law. Um, I am also, um, you know, somewhat of a, I, well, to say this, I believe very strongly in cooperative governance models um, and cooperative economic systems. Um, you can take that for what it's worth and read into it as much as you want, but um, I also know a lot about co-ops and um, the power that co-ops can wield. Um, co-ops are a governance structure and an economic model. Um, and there's a governance component and there's an economics component. And the ability, as Andrew said, the ability that co-ops have to control things in ways that individual um, you know, corporate entities cannot is a huge advantage. Um, the largest, as I understand it, at least as of last year, the largest agricultural co-op in America is Lando Lakes. Um, if you're from the East Coast or the Midwest, you've probably seen their dairy products all over the place. They are based ostensibly still in Minnesota. Um, but they actually, not only do they, um, not only do they operate within the dairy production market. They're also, over the years, they've gotten involved in the cattle production. And I think that that concept works very well when you apply it to cannabis, because as we were talking about, um, there is an element to market survival that is um, having the right strength. 
And so it's more than just a cooperative structure on the production side, but all throughout the life cycle of cannabis, from the seeds to the clones, um, to the plants, the flowers themselves, to the products that are processed with it, um, to ultimately the retail store. Um, now, most co-ops, the big co-ops, they don't get into the retail component. Um, but put, putting that aside, I do think the marijuana industry is a little different and it, um, controlling retail would probably be beneficial considering the way that different markets are set up. Um, you know, obviously Oregon is somewhat unique in that you can be completely vertically integrated. Um, so a lot of that's drinking from the fire hose, but all of that is, is to say that um, I believe this model can work. Um, we've seen it work in many different agricultural environments in different verticals. Um, you know, we've also seen it work in regular old manufacturing. Um, uh, when you look at cooperative models um, in kibbutzes in Israel, many of them have factories that produ produce, uh, produce goods that are sold all over the world. They do a lot of it in Spain. In fact, the largest, the largest <clears throat> manufacturing cooperative in the world is Mondragon, which is a Spanish-based uh, manufacturing um, enterprise that is owned by the individual workers who then own the individual um, businesses that then comprise the cooperative itself. So all of that's to say, there's a lot of ways to structure this. There's a lot of opportunity. And um, there's something that both Andrew and I believe in very strongly, um, uh, particularly the way we've watched the industry develop and then cannibalize itself in a lot of ways through competitive concepts and competitive measures that don't necessarily were not necessarily beneficial to the industry as a whole. Um, uh, I, I believe more cooperation and less cutthroat um, practices is probably to everyone's benefit on this call and probably to everyone's benefit in the industry um, and a way to shore up against what Andrew said is the, the never ending onslaught of capital interests in the industry. Ah, a question. I don't know who that is. Yeah, hi, Noah. Hi, Noah. Hi. Noah Levine. Yeah, hi. Um, wh how would you do that? Um, it's because it, one of the challenges I've seen is that um, uh, the problem is there are too many dispensaries. And so they're all trying to have really insane margins off of flour, you know, three, four, five X. Um, and so and, and I, how, how do we fix that system? Because that seems to be driving... Uh, the race to the bottom. Harry, can I expand on his question a little bit to have you talk a little bit about federated co-ops, new generation co-ops, because the cooperative um, currently is considering how do we truly structure this cooperative moving forward? Well, in terms of the, are you, is the question in terms of how do you set up the internal governance structure then? Well, let's speak first to Noah's question as far as uh, the market's complexity. Um, Noah, if you want to re-ask your question, feel, feel free. Sure. I, you sort of suggested that there's some sort of shift in dynamic needs to happen. Um, and it, as a farmer, it always feels like we have, uh, we're the, the lowest rung on the ladder. And that there's not much we can do uh, as long as dispensaries are demanding lower prices to increase their margins because there's so many dispensaries that uh, to the point earlier, they're not actually getting rich either. There's right. not enough business uh, to sustain the dispensaries. So they're forcing our prices lower so they can right. try to make money off our margins. But that's like cooking the golden goose and that yeah. doesn't work. So. I have two ways to answer that question. And I'll start with my opinion or my educated guess or understanding. Um, the sophistication of the typical cannabis consumer was largely misunderstood <laughs> at the onset of legal adult use cannabis. And by that, we mean the market 
the market data shows that top shelf flour is not actually a big seller. Most people are in and out for things like vape cartridges and crappy joints that are made with B buds, C buds. Um, and that's definitely one of the drivers here is that the demand for your products are not necessarily as robust as people thought or hoped they would be. And I'm, I don't mean, I'm not, when I say people, I'm not just talking about farmers. I'm talking about you know, investment bankers in New York who who are making market predictions and are financing some of the bigger bigger corporations. And a lot of this is driven by consumer demand because this is ultimately a consumer based, consumer facing industry. Now, as to how producers can um, effectively get reasonable livable wage prices effectively for your products right i mean that's what this is about it's about being being able to get a fair market price for your very high quality you know full sun grown marijuana and the answer then goes back to you know uh can you know controlling larger shares of the market right um because what's you guys what's in my view, what's happening here is you guys are getting squeezed on, on two ends. On the one side, the consumer demand for the product is not as robust as everybody hoped. And on the other hand, the, 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 the market is so big that there's downward price pressure. So you have two forces creating downward pricing pressure on, let's say, top shelf, full sun flour. One way to combat that is to, we, well, in theory, you can address both issues. One, you can address consumer demand through marketing strategies and collective marketing and um, you know, hoping that we can shift some of the consumer patterns to, um, to basically reflect more of what we'd like to see, which is people understanding what is good marijuana and buying it. Um, with increased demand on the consumer side, it starts to shift the whole dynamic on the supply side. The other side is supply side, which is controlling more of the market. And that's part of what co-ops do. Um, so, so, so also Perry, and don't forget, controlling the supply side in the context of a, a collective operation um, also means setting uh, pricing floors. Setting prices, right. right. That, so yeah. if dispensaries are only willing to pay, you know, if, the, if there's a market for your product, and you're being undercut because dispensaries want to have huge margins and there are growers who will you know be be you know sensitive to those pressures and sell their products at uh, at prices that are not sustainable what you want to do is bring all of the growers together and say hey guess what we've got this product that nobody else has and you're not going to get it unless you pay the price that we want i mean it's a it's a bit like you know forming a, a right new, yeah yeah. Um, so, so that's that's one of the ways that that co-ops can be so effective um, is is, you know, in, in a regular, you know, widget making uh, industry, say you're you're a bunch of uh, semiconductor manufacturers, you're not allowed to get together and, and agree on prices. You are allowed as marijuana fa farmers and any kind of farmers, you are definitely allowed to get together and say, hey, we've got this product. It's verifiable that it's a cert, uh, of a certain uh, kind and quality, which which eighty will talk about, um, and you're not getting it for less than this floor price because none of our members are going to sell it to you. Yeah, as a general matter, it's it it you know again, you know, to not betraying my background, you know, it, it's a matter of controlling and exercising control over the production side on the supply side, and as Andrew said cooperative models allow you to do things that would otherwise be illegal under the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, for example, going back to Land O'Lakes, they control the price of cattle in a large degree. Um, so when they are talking about supplying their dairy farmers, they have the security of knowing that the dairy farmers are not going to get priced out of the dairy cow market because prices are going to go up. Um, so that's one of the benefits. As far as the, the way the co-op works, there are several models, right? And they all center around this concept of, you know, governance by the co-op members. The real, the moving pieces are one, you know, 
all over the map in terms of how we structure what we call demo, you know, what some would call you know democratic uh, governance systems, right? Is it one company, one vote? Um, some have governance models that are um, pro rata effectively based on any number of factors. They're all over the map. The factors can be um, what's your market share, right? Members with bigger market share or bigger production sometimes have more say in the governance. Um, sometimes it revolves around different elements of the supply chain have different weighted votes. Um, and I think that was kind of the essence of your question, right, Aaron, is how do we set this up and what's the most what's the most um, democratic or the most fair way to set up how the co-op governs itself? Um, people hate this when I say this, but um, that's a, that is a, as an attorney, your role is to effectuate other people's ideas and plans, right? You can come up with ideas, but ultimately the decision on how Southern Oregon Family Farms wants to govern itself is a Southern Oregon Family Farms um, question. And um, in setting that up, the best way to get to where you, you want to be is to answer sort of more discrete questions, right? The, the, the point being that there is any number of governance models that can be implemented. Um, but it's up to the members to decide what you think is most fair. And it's, you know, what my role is with any client is, you know, you ask me something, is this legal? Can I do this? Is this a good idea? And I would say, yes, no, maybe tweak it like this, tweak it like that. Um, but as an outsider, right, I'm not, I'm not a member of your co-op. I'm not a farmer. I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to be making decisions, obviously, for, for how you farmers, the farmers want to govern yourself. Um, but suffice it to say that there's any number of models that can be implemented uh, and that are implemented on a general basis. Hey, maybe it's something that like we could have you, uh, we could dedicate like a board meeting, which we hold every Tuesday at five o'clock. Um, and maybe if you wouldn't mind, spending some time with us during one of those meetings to like hash out with us that kind of thing. I would be happy to do that. Um, so let me just make sure I understand. So I'd come to a board meeting and I would give sort of a more detailed description of some of these governance models and then we'd have sort of a free form discussion about what we think is the best. Yeah. Absolutely, count me in. Um, Tyler, you had your hand up earlier. If you yield your question, I want to pass the floor to Rhea to ask hers. Um, I guess mine would be really quick. It's more of a statement on what Andrew had said about uh, the floor pricing. Um, I see that model a lot in the indoor where they have a, like a walk away price. Um, Resin Ranchers performs it really well in the rec market where they're able to still be holding their price at the 2000, 1800 range for their indoor because they're consistently such a high quality that if people, dispensaries don't want to buy it, they'll walk out the door and most of the time they stop them. And they say, okay, I'll pay it because they know that they house the best indoor consistently on the market. And if we were able to do something like that with our sun grown, through the grading process of, hey, everything that we touch that comes soft branded is a 95 plus, mm -hmm. then we would be able to give ourselves possibly more power and a, a potentially more of a walk away. We deserve this price because our product is this good. Just, just a, something I noticed. That's impacted by volume, though, greatly. If you look at the headset data or BDSA data, you look at the brands, indoor brands that are pulling uh, 18 or more, uh, and you look at the actual volume that they're producing, it's very small. Um, people yeah. would be shocked by some of the top farms, how little product they're moving at that price. And I think that speaks back to what I was saying and as far as the market dynamics, right? Um, I think that unfortunate reality is in the, the way we've set up the market because of federal prohibition and all the markets being segregated state by state, the individual markets for top shelf 
are much smaller than so it's, I still think that on the national slash international level, there probably is a very robust market for top shelf flour. But with everything being siloed state by state, there's first there's no way to really understand it in the first instance because dynamics change. And again, it's just, you know, it's just the sad reality is that the lion's share of consumers just don't care. <laughs> they want, like I said, they, they buy packs of joints, they buy uh, things that are easy that they can just walk in, walk out and they can, you know, take a quick pull of a vape cartridge. Um, obviously there's market opportunities in, in the processed products industry. Um, and I think part of success of any large collective in cannabis is going to be, um, and I'd like Aidy to speak a little bit, and I, I have a kind of a stop soon, but um, is uh, developing strains and developing production that are specific to certain types of processed products. Now, a lot of that I think will go hand in hand with as the science develops. But if you look at other mature industries, um, there's a lot of specialization. And so by this, I mean, as market develops nationally and internationally, there will be processed products on the market with specific requirements in terms of THC and terpene content. Being able to have a collective that can provide for those very specific needs in a mature manufacturing market I think it's going to, it increases your market power and then it increases outlets for all of your product. Um, that being said, I, I, as I say that, I, I don't want that to be interpreted as you should you know, pivot away from high quality sun-grown flour because that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is being able to understand where the, where the market dynamics move and being able to shift and respond to them in a cooperative, basis is going to be critical to long-term success. And Andrew and I keep going back to this. The exemptions from federal antitrust law will certainly come into play in that kind of scenario even more. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, okay. To keep to Justin's timeline, um, Leah, right. can you make your question um, quick? No. no um, yep. Yep. So, um, so oh, yeah. just something that's been on my mind because clearly we're here uh, with the concept of a co-op uh, with collaborative efforts, and one of those collaborative efforts, you know, may may take a fair amount of coming together to actually set market price. But one of my questions, and just kind of a statement, maybe a question for Justin, is um, just the concept of how much flour is marked up. Um, some retail shops do are like are more in, in a reasonable realm and then some retail shops mark up you know like I mean three to four times is is standard and then many more times happens too um, so surely there's no consistency there and I do understand that bulk flour takes a little bit more effort to package up there's a little bit of loss that kind of thing but it seems like um, one good fight could be to continue to work toward elimination of the 280E um, so that so that the tax burden on retailers is not so great. And so my thought is that therefore maybe flour, like like packaged goods are not marked up as much as, as wholesale bulk flour. Um, and sometimes I feel like bulk flour is what's kind of floating the tax bill for everybody. Like you know, difficulty with processors pain and, and um, so yeah, that's my thought. I don't know, maybe Justin can, maybe can think about that a little bit more. Can I weigh on, in on this a little bit? And this is real general comment. So, you know, neither Perry and I are, you know, market analysts or, or business strategists or, or anything like that. You know, there are, there are professionals out there um, who, who can provide this type of analysis and give ideas that, okay, you guys are, are uh, uh, producers and you're working together. What are your problems? Here are some solutions, right? You as individual growers 
probably can't afford somebody like that, but maybe you can together. That's the key here, right? Together, you pool your resources, you can figure out what you, you, you can figure out better what you need and, and get the help that you need that otherwise might be unaffordable. That, that's kind of the, the whole point of all this is to pool resources and, and to, you know, and, and to use those resources effectively to gain the insights that you need to, answers no, to answer Noah's question, because that's the question, right? Like, you guys are all getting killed by all these dispensaries. You know, we've heard a couple uh, uh, ideas about how you might counteract that. Well, you know, let's take a serious look at that. Let's look, let's ask somebody whose job it is to figure it out because together you can afford it. That's, that's my two cents on that. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think now would be a good time to pass the floor on to AD and hear from her. Sure, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of things on this call that are really near and dear to my heart that I've been working on for a very long time, which is, you know, the messaging to the consumer about what is the definition of top shelf flour, right? Like even on this call, I think that as well aligned as we all are, we're probably even between us going to have subtle differences in, in what the definition of top shelf flour is and how do we get the consumer to believe us, right? Um, my method that I've been using to transmit that this is what high quality flour means is the scientific method, um, but it's not the only one, right? Like a great brand and a great marketing story and a heart and soul inside of that brand um, are also incredibly compelling ways to sell you know, a high quality product. Um, and so when I think about you know, these, um, the pricing floors and the ability to say, we consistently have a high quality product. That to me means a rigorous, reproducible and reliable tool that allows us to transmit that value, right? That we can guarantee that this is a consistent and high quality product because we have a system in place for evaluating the, the, the quality. Now, this this kind of dovetails because there's two components of quality from my perspective anyway. There's the agricultural quality, right? Like what does it look like as an agricultural commodity? But then there's also the human experience commodity or the human experience component. Um, and so it, it, and when I say human experience, it doesn't necessarily mean what are the psychoactive effects, right? What are the subjective effects? How enjoyable is it? Um, how you know, much or how little do you need to use? Um, what are the you know, relaxing versus um, you know, other kinds of subjective effects? That's a whole other layer that you know, the cultivation classic and a lot of my work focuses on, but even something as straightforward as how loud is it? How, what's the aroma intensity? What are the aroma characteristics? What does it smell like? And how good does it smell? Being able to have even that human experience, um, you know, because all of our data, which is about to be published in the scientific literature, demonstrates that THC is not related to subjective enjoyment, but aroma, the subjective quality of the aroma is related to enjoyment, right? You guys know this, the nose knows. And so um, that, those are the kind of things that I think that, you know, there's a lot, there's some tools that are out there that, that are working okay. Um, and I think that those tools can be refined for our purposes. I think that if every member of this co-op had, you know, a trained agricultural commodity grader right on the premises to be able to say, you know, here is the quality of the product, or even better having a third party come in that we can collectively, you know, sort of hire to come in and give an objective opinion of this. Um, I think that that's gonna go a long way toward supporting a high quality brand, right? The co-op as a brand um, that can consistently uh, advocate for itself for a good price in the market. Great. Is there any questions for Adi? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I can't figure out how to raise my hand again. I have a question, Aaron. Cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
So one of the problems, and I think this is something you were sort of talking about, is uh, from my understanding, the terpenes aren't an accredited test. Um, so when we've tested with multiple labs, uh, if, uh, if, if one lab's looking for 16 terpenes and SC Labs is looking for 32, we're going to get a higher terpene percentage and a more accurate representation, uh, the more terpenes they're looking for, um, and then hoping there's going to be a standardized process. So um, how does that play play into uh, determining quality cannabis from an analytical standpoint if all the labs are having a different process? I love this question because it gets at a key question in marketing, which is features versus benefits, right? Sometimes when I am shopping for a shoe, am I shopping for the density of the foam and you know what specific materials went into you know building that shoe? No, I'm looking for comfort. I'm looking for a benefit. And so if we can somewhat distance ourselves from analytical features because those analytical features do not always confer some kind of subjective benefit, if we can exclusively or mostly at least focus on the benefit, then we can kind of distance ourselves from some of those analytical problems because we see this all the time, not just with, um, with cannabis, you know, we see it with coffee, with cacao, tea, you know, like lots of other commodities have this issue where the analytical components that show up on mass spec have absolutely nothing to do with, you know, how well it will perform as a barista is, you know, pouring an Americano. Um, so I think that there's still a lot of rigorous science in the sensory component of things, but a lot of that process also has to do with the hedonic value, right? So, so what I mean by that is um, how enjoyable is it to a human nose? And that is never going to show up on a mass spec, right? And so, yes, as those analytical standards and as those testing SOPs start to normalize and you can get um, you know, sort of consistent information out of the labs, that'll help. We might be able to more closely tie those features and benefits, but I think that it's, it's really helpful, especially in this early phase to really focus on those features.